Welcome back to the Bitcoin layer. Today, we are once again joined by the foremost authority on global liquidity, someone who's got it right, cycle after cycle, Michael Howell, the CEO of Cross Border Capital. Michael, welcome back to the show. Hi, Joe. Great to be here. Thank you. Da dangerous talk. Let's uh, let's not uh, set ourselves up for a failure here. Of course, absolutely. I'll, I'll, I'll take away the accolades so as to not jinx us. But just as a quick recap and intro for our viewers, uh, explain to us a little bit about what your model is with global liquidity and why this entire uh, last year you've gotten it pretty much on the money. Okay, let, let me try. Um, global liquidity is a concept that uh, uh, goes right back to the time I worked for uh, the U.S. investment bank, Salomon Brothers. Uh, Salomon Brothers, as many people will know, was uh, at the time the world's biggest uh, trading platform for fixed income, Forex, etc. It, it was a major presence in the markets. It pretty much was the, the fixed income markets, if you like. Uh, and to actually understand the direction of, uh, of these markets, you really have to understand money flows. And Salomon Brothers put a lot of effort into understanding the flows of money worldwide. Uh, and that's pretty much what we track. So if you go back and even look at the, uh, the readings and writings of uh, gurus like Henry Kaufman, it's all about understanding a uh, flow of funds in markets. And that's really what uh, this is. This is a global flow of funds analysis. And global liquidity, as you can see here, is... Uh, a measure of the capacity of capital in the system. And that capacity of capital really matters uh, when there's a big debt burden and that debt has to be refinanced. And, you know, the whole notion that many economists uh, run with and actually even central bankers, that interest rates are the important uh, bogey, if you like, in the system is just wrong. Uh, if you've got a world that's driven by capital expenditure, a capital expenditure cycle, you know, a la textbooks, which is the mainspring of the economic cycle, then I'll come quietly and say, well, okay, maybe liquidity is a secondary factor. But when you've got economies dominated by debt refinancing with huge burdens of debt out there, and, you know, consider the world economy, $350 trillion of debt with about a five-year average maturity makes it like 60 to $70 trillion of debt. It's got to be rolled over each year. And you need balance sheet capacity among uh, uh, credit providers to provide that, to do that role. And that's what liquidity is. Any mismatch between the size of the role and the amount of liquidity available, you get refinancing crises. And hey, what have we seen in the last few years is several refinancing crises. The Fed is trying to stop another one right now. And that's why the Fed is back in the system pushing in liquidity. Uh, that's what China's doing. It's putting liquidity into its markets. And ultimately, global liquidity uh, is rising. The level is rising, and that's inflating asset markets again worldwide. It's a cycle. The Bitcoin layer is proud to be sponsored by River. Go check them out today at river.com slash TBL for a special offer of up to $100 worth of Bitcoin for free when you go sign up. Now, River is a Bitcoin only exchange. That means there's no confusion when you go there. They allow you to deposit and withdraw via Lightning Network. They have a zero fee recurring purchase order feature. And what we love the most about River is not only do they encourage you to get self-custody, but they're there to help educate you on self-custody and everything there is to know about Bitcoin. Go check them out today, river.com slash TBL. It's a cycle indeed. So we have China, we have the United States. Uh, I'll just bring up this chart really quickly here. This is the federal deficit as a percentage of GDP. Um, and it's, it's quite staggering at this stage. You said that uh, obviously there's a whole lot of debt out there, a whole lot of it needs to be refinanced. Um, it, it seems like the entire global economic order is really totally dependent on rising debt. And you see that here in the US. Talk a little bit about the United States debt situation. Um, currently we're at 35 trillion, we're poised to hit 50 trillion in, in less than 20 years. I have a feeling we'll probably get there sooner given how reliant the U.S. economy is on, on, uh, on, on ever-increasing debt loads. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, well, let me, let me try. And I, I, I'm going to stress the fact that, um, you know, the, the U.S. here may be, one, may be one of the cleanest shirts in the laundry. Uh, there's a lot of dirtier ones. Uh, so I'm not hitting on the U.S., but the U.S. matters because it's such an important economy. And, you know, what you've got there is uh, an increasing deficit, as you highlight. That is largely coming through for a number of reasons. I mean, let, let's cite three key reasons. 
One is that uh, there's obviously a, a discretionary spending program that's been undertaken by the current administration. That's sizable. The deficit has, uh, has ballooned out because of this spend these spending commitments. Uh, and that clearly is going to run for some time. And that's probably a key reason why the economy is so buoyant right now. But actually underlying that, you've got two other factors. One is that mandatory spending, uh, you know, things like Medicare, Social Security are really starting to climb. They're escalating now, really because of aging demographics uh, in the you know, the society is aging in the US. People are demanding more uh, of these services, these mandatory services. There's no way you can unhook from that. And the third factor is in the interest bill. Uh, interest rates are going up. Uh, the interest charge on the debt is going up. That's adding to the debt burden in the long term. So all these factors are coming together and they're sort of messing up the arithmetic of public financing. And what you've got now is a situation where debt is just building on top of debt, building on top of debt, etc. And the debt to GDP ratio in America is starting to skyrocket. That's a worrying factor when the US dollar is the sort of world reserve currency. And so we've got to be very alert to that, to that, to that risk. Uh, if you go back in history and you look at what happened to Britain, uh, when sterling was a major currency worldwide and Britain was facing, uh, you know, let's say not dissimilar challenges, particularly in the wake of World War II, uh, you saw, I mean, or just, just look back and look back and think what happened to sterling. I mean, sterling, the sterling pound has been devastated, uh, you know, in the last 50 years because of these, these debt considerations. Uh, and actually, you know, what we're looking at now is probably even worse, uh, an even worse background uh, than Britain faced in the, in the wake of World War II. So, you know, this is the problem that we've got. Now, let me just stress one other thing, which I think is very important to say in all this, is you've got to distinguish between public debt and private debt. And the reason for doing that is that private debt, if it goes sour, if it sours, you get debt deflation. So in other words, if the private sector defaults, uh, that is a deflationary effect on, on an economy. If public debt defaults, well, in fact, the reality is it doesn't default, it tends to be inflated away. And what you can really say as a very broad summary is that private debt crises are deflationary, but public debt crises are inflationary. Because the government doesn't default, what it does is it prints money to pay back its debts. It monetizes the debt. Now, that is what is going on now in several countries and the heads up is it's happening in the US as well. And what I would say is we're maybe at the early, we're in the foothills of this process, but it's happening. Um, and all I would suggest is don't take my word for it. Take a look at the latest projections from the Bipartisan Congressional Budget Office, which have just been published in February, uh, uh, i.e. this month. And what they do is project out uh, the fiscal arithmetic for the US to 2034, they show what the Federal Reserve is required to do in terms of taking up debt. And if you start to work out the math of that, you can see the effect that has on the Fed's balance sheet and in particular on what we call Fed liquidity, which is the amount of liquidity the Fed is forced to inject into financial markets. And the numbers are going up significantly. I mean, just to, to put it into perspective, uh, you know, the peak of the US balance sheet, the Federal Reserve's balance sheet was around about eight trillion US dollars, or maybe just a tad above that, it's slated to go to something like 16 trillion. It's going to double by 2034. So anyone that thought that, you know, this was the end of QE, in other words, balance sheet expand, expansion, think again. But the more important statistic within that is basically Fed liquidity. And Fed liquidity is the amount of liquidity that the Federal Reserve from its balance sheet injects into markets. Currently, that number is running at about 3 trillion but it's slated to go up to $8 trillion on our estimates uh, by 2034. So what you've got is a growing participation by the Federal Reserve in the markets. Now, what you can see on the slide that you've put up there is the red line, which is actually looking at what the Fed balance sheet has been doing on a weekly basis over the last five or six years. And you can see that that peaked and it's starting to come down. And that decline is what the authorities call their QT program, uh, which is the runoff of Treasury securities uh, on their balance sheet. The dotted line that is running below the red line is what the original projections were suggesting would happen. Uh, the red line is what we're actually getting. And the 
extrapolation of that red line in the sort of thicker uh, red dotted line, broken line, is basically what we think is going to happen over the next few months. So what you're seeing is a further decline in the size of the Fed balance sheet. But the orange line is the important number. This is what the markets look at. Increasingly, more and more funds, particularly big quant funds, are starting to look at this data and they're using it to trade because this is a very important heads up to the way the markets move. Uh, Fed liquidity is a concept we first came up with uh, about five or six years ago, published in a book called Capital Wars that I wrote all about global liquidity. And basically, it comes out of Fed watching, which was a skill that uh, was it, basically something that was devised at Salomon Brothers to understand how central banks, and particularly the Federal Reserve, works. The orange line is liquidity, net liquidity inflows into the market. Again, we projected that. The wobbles that you get in that line over the, next, over the coming weeks is all to do with the tax season or tax paying season in the US, where April is likely to see a flood of money coming into the Treasury. And that money will be basically, unless it's recycled, of course, will be drained from money markets. So what you've got is uh, generally a rising trend, but with a few wobbles. Now, the reason that this is critically important in the near term for markets is that the counterpart of Fed liquidity is basically bank reserves. Money in money markets will translate into the reserve levels of US banks. And if US banks are crimped in terms of the amount of liquidity they have, what you find is you get crises like SBB, Silicon Valley Bank, etc., and, you know, maybe some of the latest travails in uh, in the regional banking sector are all to do with the fact that they've got a low level of reserves. Now, the Fed is worried about this as a mistake. Uh, just go back and listen to Laurie Logan's speech. Laurie Logan, president of Dallas Fed. She used to be in charge of the SOMA account um, uh, at the Federal Reserve, which is the, the, the account that looks after treasuries and money market operations and repo activity, etc., and she gave a warning that they're going to have to start looking seriously at curtailing QT because it may have a deleterious effect on money market liquidity. And that's something that we can confirm it will if it continues in the current pace. We've long said, uh, I mean, maybe for nearly 18 months now, that it's very likely by March of 24, so upcoming, the Fed will have to seriously rethink its QT proposals and likely uh, you know, slim these down significantly. Uh, liquidity in the banking sector is critical, and the administration will not want a regional banking crisis popping up in an election year. They so that's will. why I think there's the focus here. Excellent. And this leads me perfectly into the, the next chart, the next topic I was going to talk about. You brought up March. One of the things that's been keeping bank, banks limping along has been the bank term funding program currently there are roughly $165 billion worth of outstanding loans. And I have this chart here for you, for you to interpret. It has to do with regional banking reserves. Specifically, this is uh, uh, cash reserves at small banks. Um, and you can see here the blue line is with BTFP. So this is small banks cash reserves with the bank term funding program. You can see that it's following kind of the same line, like you said, as a uh, fed exactly. as a fed balance sheet and you could see the red line the red dotted line is without the bank term funding program and so essentially what you have mapped out there is the same level we bounced off of in 2019 the same level that we went under and then the silicon valley bank signature bank regional banking crisis happened without bank term funding program we're right back under that constraint level and it's set to expire in march um is it going to expire yeah well, I mean, the thing to remember is that it, it, the, the program expires in March per se, uh, but banks can basically go in and get funding for 12 months prior to March. Um, the Federal Reserve has said that they are uh, they will encourage banks that need it to go to the discount window. But now that's not necessarily a great alternative. But I think that, you know, they, they're clearly going to be conscious or one would hope they're going to be conscious of the constraints that you put at, you point out here. And the whole issue comes back to what is the level of ample reserves in the system? And the truth of the matter is that nobody really knows. And that's the scary fact. What we can do is make projections. Our projections are a lot higher than what the Federal Reserve has published in terms of what a minimum or, or, or adequate reserves, ample reserves, etc. And we would argue that the, the level of reserves overall in the system 
come down to a crunch point and potentially hit the buffers around April of this year. That's when you could see some serious problems. And that's largely because the, te- the so-called Treasury General account, and this is sort of getting, we're getting into the weeds here, but the Treasury General account, which is the account of the US government at the Federal Reserve, will be bloated with tax revenues through April. And the tax paying season will be pretty good, uh, you know, partly because, or largely, one would say perhaps because, Wall Street has, had, has been on a, on a burn for the last 12, 15 months. And therefore, tax payments will come in quite, uh, you know, quite, quite well, quite heavily. What that will mean is money will be drained out of markets unless it's not. In other words, unless it's not recycled. And that's really the issue that we've got out there. Uh, the, the parallel point is how is the government there going forward going to start funding itself? And these are other issues that really come out and will, you know, are issues which absorb, potentially absorb liquidity from markets. So in other words, that, you know, what's happening here is the Treasury uh, and the Federal Reserve are kind of walking a knife edge. Uh, they, they, you know, they say in in Ireland, uh, you know, if you if you want to travel to Dublin, don't start from here, and that's really the question. It's a, it's a bad place to begin. It's a bad place to begin. In, in the vein of the Treasury funding itself, I want to ask you really quickly about the the Fed's reverse repo facility. Um, this has kind of acted as something of a cushion to the impact on financial markets of the Treasury's funding. Obviously, capital has been able to come out of here and go into new Treasuries. Um, this looks like it's slated to run out very soon. Talk to us about the implications of the RRP draining down to zero. Well, I mean, the, the RRP is basically a, a pool of funds that was, uh, was put in place after COVID uh, in, the, in the period, in the wake of the period where Treasury bill issuance had declined significantly and the market demanded some alternative. And the reason basically for this was all to do with the COVID policy response. Uh, because of the checks that were issued by uh, the government, uh, bank, uh, bank deposit accounts swelled significantly and, the, and money moved into money market funds. But essentially, the, the system needed short-term instruments to invest in and there weren't sufficient treasury bills. And effectively, what the Federal Reserve did was to invent this reverse repo facility to absorb some of the liquidity so it had extra control over interest rate setting. Now, you could argue that this is sort of redundant now in many ways, and it's clearly running off. Um, but as it runs off, it is, uh, if you like, a reverse drain. It's an injection of money back into the system because this money that sat on the Fed's balance sheet was not being recycled. As it comes off the Fed balance sheet, it is being recycled, so it adds to bank reserves. Now, what you've got potentially here is uh, something like uh, half a trillion dollars that could go back into the system. The reality is that that may not decline as rapidly as, uh, as, you know, as you might suggest, looking at an eyeball extrapolation. And part of the reason for that is the Treasury has just decided to curtail uh, the uh, or curtail the growth of treasury bills as a funding instrument. Uh, treasury bills were used extensively in Q4 and Q1 of this year, or have been used Q4, Q1 of this year. Uh, the projections in Q2 is that treasury bill issuance will come right down. And if treasury bill issuance comes right down, what are these money market funds going to use as an instrument? They have to stick with the reverse repo facility. So in other words, what you've seen is a big drop. That big drop has been coincident with a very, very hefty bill issuance by the Treasury. In particular, uh, they were designing issues, bill issues that were really focused on exactly what the money funds would want. So there was already, if you like, sort of targeting, uh, targeted marketing of these of these bills to the funds. Now what they're doing is they're stepping back from that. Bottom line is the reverse repo facility will likely fall. But I would think it's going to start leveling out, uh, you know, not too far below where we are now. Now, the number that's on the Fed balance sheet is a much bigger number, remember, because this is the, the domestic component. What you've also got to take into account is what foreigners are holding. And foreigners also hold reverse repos. Uh, that equally may not decline that rapidly. So there will be a residual on the Fed balance sheet. So what I would suggest is you're probably looking at maybe perhaps one to two hundred billion dollars coming out of this facility overall net of net uh, over the next few months. So it's a help, but it's not a solution. Got it. OK, it's a help. It's not a solution. So I, I have one kind of adjacent question here in regards to domestic liquidity here in the United States. 
Um, the San Francisco Fed has been tracking uh, pandemic era excess savings. So all of the direct monetary stimulus that people received in the form of checks, small business loans, et cetera. Um, this reached a high of $2.1 trillion in August of 2021. Currently it's at $200 billion as of December and it's slated to run out by March. Uh, we talk about March as kind of this, you know, this area where a lot of things may get hairy. The bank term funding program is ending. Um, and, and also these pandemic era excess savings are, are running down. Do you have any thoughts on this as it relates to market liquidity? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not too sure what goes into this particular measure, so I haven't looked at it that closely. I would imagine it is largely, uh, largely consists of uh, excess bank deposits and money fund, the excess money in, in money funds. I guess that's how they put it together. I think that another way to look at this is to say, well, OK, what you've got to remember over this period is that a lot of that money has been recycled uh, going, uh, and, and used to basically buy government debt. So, uh, you know, one of the things that's helped the government fund itself is that bond issuance, in other words, treasury notes uh, and bonds uh, and probably some bills as well, have been absorbed by the, by the household sector uh, through this mechanism. Now, if this has come right down, then what you've got is a dilemma because a ready source of finance um, is disappearing. And the whole point about looking at liquidity and tracking it is that all money that's anywhere must be somewhere. <laughs> you know, it doesn't disappear unless the Federal Reserve actually sort of takes it onto its balance sheet and, uh, uh, and sort of reduces it and, and eliminates it. But effectively, what you've got here is that problem which is appearing somewhere else. So you're sort of squeezing a balloon in one area it's bulging elsewhere. So the problems don't go away. And what this is likely to do is to put a lot of pressure on other entities in the economy to buy uh, government debt. And for example, the banks may be called upon to buy more treasuries. Uh, and equally, what you've got is probably the institutions doing that. Now, the problem that that runs into is that if the banks are buying treasuries, and the banks typically buy very short dated treasuries when they buy treasuries or they buy bills, I mean, that is monetization. Pure and simple. So, you know, whichever way it cuts here, uh, there is a problem which emanates from the debt burden that the US economy and other economies have got, or the public debt burdens. Um, so the, these are issues that need to be considered. Um, and, you know, that's the, that's the problem that we're citing here. I mean, this is, this is not a new problem. We know that monetization is, a, is an issue, but the whole problem is the scale now is much, much bigger and it's sort of, you know, it surprised us with the speed by which it suddenly appeared. And that's the, the, the issue that investors have got to start to realize. What we're facing is a period of extensive uh, and large scale monetary inflation to pay for all this public debt. And that is the problem. That is the problem. It, it all comes back down to monetization. So with that in mind, let's take one last look at um, the Federal Reserve's liquidity injections this is a chart that we haven't taken a look at yet. They've obviously been doing QT for some time. You, you talk about debt monetization, and we're heading into a period where that's going to be necessary. With that in mind, can QT last? How long can QT continue for at the current rate? Well, I mean, I think that, I mean, maybe, maybe I've, I've said it, I'll say it again. I think that we're going we're gonna to reach, uh, you know, a watershed sometime around uh, the end of Q1. Uh, because I think that, you know, that was the time anyway that we were we envisioned that the Federal Reserve would have a rethink. I think the Laurie Logan statement or speech in January, it was a heads up that they're seriously debating this now. And you've also got the issue which you can, uh, which you cited, where you look at the rundown of the bank or the elimination of the bank term funding program in March and other factors are causing a potential crunch in terms of regional bank liquidity upcoming. And the market does, the markets don't don't like these uh, these issues. I mean, they're they're worrying things because it's all they they raise the bogey of funding problems. And we saw what happened going back to uh, 2019 with the repo crisis of how quickly the markets can turn if they sniff a repo crisis or a funding crisis coming up. Now, what this chart here is showing is our index in orange of the scale of Federal Reserve liquidity injections uh, through this cycle. Uh, beginning in 2019. It pretty much matches, until it doesn't recently, uh, the dotted line, which is the cycle uh, from uh, sorry 1997 to 2003. 
and that was the Y2K bubble period. Now, these cycles are pretty are pretty normal. I think what we you know what we know here is that the Federal Reserve is a super tanker that is turning around. The point is, and this is the point to stress, the super tanker is turning. There's no question about that. I mean, the, the Fed has given us, Jay Powell has given us a heads up that rates are coming down. All we're kind of debating here is when, by how much, and that may be conditioned by the state of the economy. But the other thing that will come into the equation and will come into the equation in terms of liquidity is the health of the regional banking system and the need for more liquidity. And I would suggest that orange line is going to start to jump pretty high uh, in coming months. They're going to have to put a lot of liquidity into the system. Uh, the whole public face of the Fed has been about, uh, you know, we're maintaining high rates. I think they're using high rates clearly to slow the economy. I think one could debate whether that's an effective strategy or not. But it looks like it's worked in terms of inflation coming down. There's been some, you know, some great uh, traction in terms of getting uh, inflation lower. That may have been, you know, that may have been fortuitous. But hey, whatever, let's take what we've got. Uh, and I think they've used liquidity at the same time through a back door to try and support the banks. Now, I think that that's going to have to scale up significantly for all the reasons that I've said and the reasons that you said. So Q QE is coming back. You might call it something else. It may, have, may be a different name, a different acronym. Maybe we call it QS for quantitative support. But hey, it's, it's, it's coming back. And in the medium term, the deterioration in public finances is going to cause that to grow even faster. It's going to cause it to grow even faster. Absolutely right. And I do have a feeling they'll come up with a new name for it. I mean, the, the acronym department at the Fed never slows down with, with new and unique acronyms for everything they do. This is the last, uh, last chart that I'd like to talk about in terms of uh, Fed liquidity here. Um, you talk about how it's going to need to increase. This is a pretty staggering chart. Um, you kind of break down the sources here um, over the next decade where you feel U.S. Fed liquidity is uh, going to come from. If you, if you wouldn't mind, uh, please break this down. Yeah, let me let me uh, show this or go through the, the mechanics behind this chart. So what you've got is uh, a number of different blocks. The brown blocks at the bottom are the implied growth in the size of a uh, Fed liquidity, injections of liquidity by the Fed from its balance sheet that come out of the uh, 2023, mark you, Congressional Budget Office uh, projections. The latest Congressional Budget Office projections for 2024 are not in here. They're a bit higher than that, but the direction is pretty clear. The, uh, the next bar up, uh, which you can see in 24 and 25, is a little bit in 26, is the assumed rundown in reverse repos. So that's the effect on Fed liquidity of reverse repos being recycled. Uh, the next bar up is basically then looking at saying, OK, Let's assume on top of that, that the QT program is slowed pretty much as Laurie Logan has been flagging. And that's the effect that will have on basically treasury purchases uh, and liquidity injections in markets. In other words, the Fed will hold more treasuries and that will be uh, effectively a liquidity injection. And then the lighter uh, bar right at the top of the, uh, of the chart, uh, the sort of flesh colored um, bar is our assumptions to say, look, this is assuming that defence spending, defence spending alone, uh, starts to increase more aggressively uh, than what the CBO projected in uh, February of 2023. And that's trying to take into account these growing conflicts in the world and, you know, whatever one throws in there, uh, the Israel Hamas conflict, uh, the Ukraine conflict, maybe potentially concerns over Taiwan, whatever it may be. But defence spending has got to increase by a lot more than was being projected at the time uh, this, this was done uh, about a year ago. So what we've done is to say, let's take a simple assumption that uh, defence spending basically starts to grow at about, or it starts to increase uh, at about 5% of GDP. So in other words, uh, it's moving with GDP, but it continues at a 5% rate. So that's, that's how we get up there. So in other words, uh, defence spending goes back to a more normal, let's say, Cold War-ish type level. Uh, and that's the result you get. So uh, you can snip any one of those assumptions and get a different result. Uh, but that's how we see it. So the percentages that you see on top of that are the likely increases year after year in terms of Fed liquidity. I wouldn't make a, you know, a big point about the dip in uh, 2025. Uh, that's just how the maths comes out. Uh, and that's to a large extent uh, conditioned by the base assumption 
uh, uh, that we've made, we've, we've taken from the CBO. Got it. Fantastic. I want to switch gears here and talk a little bit about China. Obviously, they're facing their own set of uh, circumstances, right? They're fighting deflation. They're fighting um, lower and lower new investment every single year. I just pulled up this chart. Um, we're nearing uh, net negative capital outflows. Um, so what has China done to offset this and what kind of effect does that have on global liquidity? I think what we what we got to remember here is that this is not a Lehman moment for China, okay? Uh, or so it's not a Lehman crisis um, time for China. They're not, not going to be a Lehman as far as we can see. The, the you know the financial system is different from America's. It's not as complex, uh, and the People's Bank of China has much much greater control over uh, different institutions. It's much more like the depression years in China for in America for China right now. And what we're seeing in China is classic debt deflation. Now, we've seen debt deflation around the world in different guises before. We've seen it clearly in Japan in the wake of the Japanese bubble in 1989. Uh, we saw it in Scandinavia about the similar time. Uh, we've seen it in emerging Asia in the late 1990s, etc. The route out of debt deflations are very clear. You've got to pump in huge amounts of liquidity. In other words, you've got to, you've got to offset the monetary deflation with the monetary inflation. And you've got to allow your currency to devalue significantly. That is the only route that China can take. If it does not do that, uh, in other words, it does not get its real exchange rate down, you're going to get a continuation of this, these problems in China. I detect that China is beginning to make those moves. The chart that you see is measuring capital outflow from China. Now, we can go into maybe the mechanism on the background, and it would sound conspiratorial, but all I would say as a heads up is it's long been our view that there was a lot more behind the devaluation of the Japanese yen uh, than simple interest rate differentials. In my several decades in financial markets, I have never, ever seen a major currency crushed with the speed that the yen was crushed uh, in the spring of 2022. Markets don't do that to major currencies. Only governments do. And I think there was a deliberate ploy uh, to use the yen as a stalking horse to weaken uh, the Chinese yuan and put pressure on the Chinese authorities. It worked, and it worked brilliantly, in the sense that the yuan subsequently devalued. Uh, it moved through the psychological seven, and we think it's on the way to eight. And what you're seeing uh, as a result of that is from, certainly from the middle of last year, from June of last year, the Chinese authorities through the People's Bank have injected a whopping seven and a half trillion uh, renminbi yuan into their money markets. That's over a hundred billion dollars. These are these are big big size amounts, and it continues to do so. So what they're trying to do is to goose the economy or get uh, some recovery by pumping in liquidity. And you can see the evidence there. We you know we look at this, we monitor it on a daily basis. Now, if you kind of roll forward here. Uh, there are good and bad implications in this. There are maybe good implications for the Chinese economy because more liquidity will actually help it to stabilize. That's the reality. There are bad, bad implications for the rest of the world because if China devalues, it's going to export deflation uh, elsewhere. Uh, China, we think, is broadly speaking going down the route uh, which many economists do not recommend uh, and certainly don't project, which is more exports and more infrastructure. This is the old Chinese model uh, of growth, which has been tried and tested before, but it's been rolled out further. And there will be dumping of goods in world markets. They'll be very competitive uh, in things they're selling. Europe will be hosed by this because there's a lot of trade between China uh, and Europe. Uh, the US has got trade barriers and maybe may be protected, but you're going to see a rise of protectionism in the world economy through this. The other problem that you've got is that if China devalues its currency, what happens to emerging Asia? Emerging Asia is locked into the Chinese orbit. China is the dominant economy. There are massive supply chains across the region. And if China devalues the yuan, other Asian currencies will have to follow. I do not believe that you're likely to see a sizable recovery in the Japanese yen, but that is the consensus trade that most people have on. Uh, I don't think that will happen given this context. What you're therefore looking at is potentially uh, currency, a lot more currency volatility upcoming. Now, 
What's the best way to protect against that? Well, one is to move into the US dollar. That's the traditional safe haven. But the trouble is what we can see is alongside US public finances are deteriorating pretty significantly. Okay, do you really want to be holding uh, a US dollar if the government or the Federal Reserve is increasingly monetizing debt and that debt burden is escalating? And that's clearly got to be a question to think about. So you want generally against this deteriorating economic and financial climate worldwide, more monetary hedges. And monetary hedges are really the order of the day. Now, when I talk about monetary hedges, I'm not talking about necessarily high street inflation hedges. The two things are very different. High street inflation is a hybrid, in other words, consumer prices are a hybrid between monetary inflation factors and cost inflation or deflation factors. In other words, think of again the split between the private sector and the public sector. The private sector is a source of productivity gain and innovation and falling costs. Just think of the price of technology goods, you know, your, 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 uh, your phone uh, or your computer, etc., uh, either fallen in price or radically improved in quality in the last two or three decades. So in other words, you're getting cost deflation uh, from the private sector. But in terms of the monetary inflation dimension, which is the public sector, you're getting more and more monetary inflation. Remember, governments do not default, particularly reserve currency countries like the US or Eurozone or uh, Japan. They don't default, they just print money. They just print their, print their debt, their way out of debt. And that's what you're getting. So in the high street, these two things come together. They come together in consumer prices and monetary inflation combined with cost deflation. The broken line on the chart that you see there at the lower part of the chart is what happens to US high street prices. That's the index of US uh, consumer prices from 1975 onwards. Clearly it's gone up, that's been painful. But if you look alongside the black line is what's happened to global liquidity. Global liquidity has skyrocketed over this period to over $200 trillion. Okay? If, you put, if it had grown with inflation, it would have been up barely, uh, what, 25, uh, 25 trillion. So it's gone dramatically more than that. The orange line on that chart is what we call monetary hedges. It's basically crypto, the value of crypto, the market value of crypto, plus the market value of gold. Clearly, before around 2015, uh, the contribution of crypto was zero. And so that was all gold, market value of gold. Since 2015, increasingly, the value of crypto has come in and become a bigger and bigger component of this, uh, of this uh, total, of this portfolio, if you like. But you can see there, looking at the chart, eyeballing the chart, that actually crypto and gold together, some hybrid, are really very good monetary inflation hedges. And that's what we've got to think about. There are others out there. Uh, residential real estate's not bad, of course. We know that from experience. Um, the stock market's not bad either. Technology shares seem to be pretty good. Um, so all these things are alternatives. But the thing that does not come out well is fixed income securities. They are not a monetary hedge. <laughs> they may be a deflation hedge, but they're certainly not a monetary hedge. For sure. And like, just like you mentioned, in, the, in this long term period that we're entering of debt monetization, um, you're going to have a huge expansion in the global money supply. And you want to be holding in the face of that, not fixed income securities that stand to devalue tremendously, but but the hard money is what you want to be holding. Fantastic. Yeah, exactly. You you want you want something which will hedge uh, the uh, yeah, the the devaluation of paper money is exactly phenomenal. So I have one last question for you here, and it has to do with uh, with one of the charts that you had in the pack. Um, last time you were on, this was extremely prescient in hindsight because 2023 ended up being a very good year uh, for uh, for U.S. stocks, for financial markets more broadly. Um, there's this big global central bank easing impulse going on right now, even if the United States currently um, is, in, is getting increasingly tight more and more businesses this year are going to need to roll their debt into tighter financial conditions. The world over, um, one third of central banks are easing. And as a function of that, the global central bank liquidity indexes you have here is in an uptrend. So I'll ask you, 
very broadly, where are we headed? Well, I think we're, in terms of markets and risk assets, I think we're heading higher, okay? I think we've got to draw a caveat here. And that caveat is that if you look at the average bull market uh, on Wall Street, take the S&P 500 as a, as a benchmark, uh, from our reckoning, uh, it rises from the trough to the peak by around about 40% or so. Now, you know, we've clearly come a good way through that. But the important thing to say is you normally get two thirds of those gains after 15 months, right? Wall Street bottomed just under 15 months ago. So what we're, what we're seeing is an on-track recovery, I would argue, and maybe the math is on track too. So there may not be an awful lot left in terms of looking at the aggregate stock market. So what you've got to start to do is to think about alternatives here. Um, now, those alternatives may well be things like Bitcoin. They may be things like gold. They may be thinking again about residential real estate. They may be thinking about diversifying into other markets like Japan or possibly, if you're brave, China. Um, but these are alternatives one's got to think about. But we're not saying this is the end of the party. But I think it was you know, an old adage that I believe was coined by Warren Buffett, which is, you know, enjoy the party, but dance near the door. Now, we may not be that close to the door, but we're moving in that direction. And I think we've got to be cognizant of the fact that, uh, you know, good times don't last forever. And they're not about to end for sure, but let's just keep you know one eye on the on the door before it closes. And all I'm saying is, look at the averages, play the averages, and you've got this uh, you know this this constraint out there. The Fed is clearly going to put more money into the markets and ease again, but you know markets are forward looking, and what you've really got to start to think about is what does the world look like not now, but what does it look like in a year's time? And that's the that's that's the sort of heads up for what investments are going to do. Extremely well said. Party's raging now. Don't fight it, but also be cautious. That's a, that's an excellent analogy. Dance near the door. I really like that. Uh, Michael, do you have any closing thoughts, any closing words um, for our viewers before we close out here? I'd just say, look, the uh, I mean, as long as I've been in this business and I learned this sort of, uh, you know, at the feet of, uh, of really clever people, geniuses like Henry Kaufman, Marty Leibowitz at Salomon Brothers, what you've got to do is to understand money flows in markets. That's really what drives the system. Um, you know, Salomon Brothers built it, built a huge, huge business on understanding money flows worldwide. And uh, all this is really doing is, uh, you know, trying to translate that into a, re in, into a research sense uh, to what other asset classes may benefit in the modern world. Things like monetary hedges, such as Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies and gold. But you've got to watch global liquidity. It's not only the Fed that matters. You've got to start looking at other central banks in particular, uh, such as the People's Bank of China. This is, uh, you know, it's a, it's a giant as well. And it's got a balance sheet, which is likely to expand dramatically. Excellent. Very well said, as always. I learned a whole lot. I know the viewers did, too. Uh, Michael, where can people find you? Uh, probably two routes. Uh, there is um, a Substack which is called Capital Wars. Um, the Substack uh, is always named after a book I wrote uh, about three or four years ago, uh, which is actually, as the eponymous name suggests, Capital Wars, which is about the struggles for dominance in the world economy and all about global liquidity. Uh, so that's that's one uh, that's one um, uh, channel. The other channel is basically our website, which is uh, crossbordercapital.com. Uh, we provide institutional research services uh, through that mechanism. Uh, which is something we've been doing for the last uh, you know, 20, 25 years or so. Phenomenal. You heard it, guys. Go check out the book Capital Wars. I myself have given it a read. It is excellent. I'd highly recommend. And, of course, crossbordercapital.com. Michael, once again, brilliant as always. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Great pleasure, Joe. Thanks. Thanks again. The Bitcoin Layer is proud to be sponsored by River. Go check them out today at river.com slash TBL for a special offer of up to $100 worth of Bitcoin for free when you go sign up. Now, the reason that we love River is that they are a Bitcoin only exchange. There's no confusion when you go there on what you're buying. But really importantly about River is that they do not use a third party custodian. They have their own multi-signature solution that means that when you buy Bitcoin on River, that Bitcoin is not being stored by another party. River is storing it in their own multi-signature way, and they encourage you to get your Bitcoin into your own self-custody and help with educational resources on that front. Go check them out today, river.com slash TBL.